word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of meeting as a local assembly freely and publicly. We thank you for the many lives, especially those in military service to this nation. We thank you for the many lives that have been sacrificed. We thank you for those who have given the ultimate sacrifice as well as those who have been willing to give the ultimate sacrifice if necessary. We thank you for the freedom we cherish and we pray for our nation and we thank you for your grace toward our nation and we ask that you would help us to take every opportunity to advance in the spiritual life so that we can be a part of solving the problems of this nation rather than a part of contributing to the problems of our nation. And as we approach the scriptures for our second session tonight, we ask that God the Holy Spirit would illuminate your word to those in this gathering and to those who listen by recording. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Isaiah chapter 14, which was directed toward the king of Babylon, but has double reference. That's a principle which often comes up in the prophetic word, double reference. Reference which is immediate or might even be fulfilled in the years the prophet was still alive, and then reference far beyond in both time and sometimes in person. There, were, uh, there was something said about David that Peter pointed out during the Pentecostal era that uh, could not have pertained to David. It had to pertain to Christ. And yet these double references are found within the same passages of Scripture. So there's certain content in Isaiah verses 14, 12 through 14, which we just read in the closing of the last session. There are certain references that definitely are directed to the king of Babylon, the the uh, king of Babylon, historical to the time frame in which the uh, prophet Isaiah wrote. But then there are references which could only be to someone who is not even a human being. And of course, these references, it is generally accepted among students of the Bible. These references are to Lucifer, as he was known in the Latin before he became known as Satan. I'll read Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. <coughs> Excuse me, on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the, reach, in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So here we have written in somewhere between 740 and 
uh, the late 600s B.C., we have the literal king of Babylon at the time, but again, the principle of double reference. And we have the famous five I wills. And these had to be related to an angelic being because how could a man ascend to heaven, usurp God's throne, uh, set his own throne on high, ascend above the heights of the clouds? Uh, you say, well, that could be done in an airplane today. Well, we're talking 600 B.C., uh, so that was not possible at the time as far as ascending above the heights of the clouds. Make himself like the Most High. How could a, a human being do these things? A human being could not. We also saw the principle of reference a couple studies ago in Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19, which was a look at Lucifer before his fall, and we looked at Jeremiah 4, verses 23 through 26, a look at the world after Lucifer's fall. We also looked at Matthew 25, verse 41, where the devil, that is the false accuser, uh, the devil is a translation of diabolos, D-I-A-B-O-L-O-S uh, in the Koine Greek, which means false accuser or slanderer. He's also known as Satan, which uh, in the Greek comes from Satan in the Hebrew, uh, which means an adversary. He's also known as, I believe it's translated, an adversary in most Editions, but uh, this is the Greek word antidikos in uh, a verse in, uh, I believe it's First Peter uh, 5 8. Uh, and as an antidikos, he is an opponent in a lawsuit. That is the definition given by the uh, lexicon that was edit, edited, uh, actually translated into English from the German scholar Walter Bauer, uh, two fellows named Arndt and Gingrich, that was their last name, translated that excellent lexicon uh, from the translation of the Greek into German. Well, they translated the, the uh, German into English. And there, somewhere along the line, there was a fellow named Danker, uh, by the last name of Danker, involved too. But uh, Antidikos, used of that adversary who goes around uh, seeking whom he may devour, uh, that is an opponent in a lawsuit, one of the primary meanings of that word. So we know that the devil, and known by these other names as well, and his co-conspirators who are now fallen angels, they were, uh, Satan was an angel, and then uh, there were all the other angels as well, this was a host, not a race, that was created by God before the human race was created, beginning with the man and the woman in the garden. Well, uh, you have a host of angels. I, I say a host because uh, they don't procreate as do human beings uh, into other angels now. Uh, we can, I could, uh, uh, I could take a, another course here, but uh, we're not going to go there tonight. We're just going to say that these fallen angels then became what we refer to as demons. 
And so you have two categories of angels now, the elect angels, that is the, the many angels, we don't know how many, but many, 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 and uh, they are they are holy angels, they have uh, integrity, they are spiritual beings, but they include uh, Michael, they include Gabriel, and you have the fallen angels, which are now known as demons, and uh, they are headed by Satan, who is the god of this age, uh, with a small g in Second Corinthians chapter 4. If our gospel be veiled, it is veiled by the God of this age to those who are lost, in whom the God of this age has blinded, so that he might blind them from the gospel of the glory of Christ. In Second Corinthians chapter 4, uh, the early verses. Well, the fallen angels, along with Satan, have been sentenced to everlasting fire. We looked at the reference to that last week, Matthew 25, verse 41. The sentence will be carried out in the future. It will be executed. Uh, and we find that in Revelation 20, verse 10. And that's going to be at the very end of the millennium. Satan will be bound for a thousand years, so he'll be rendered, uh, his activity will be limited, his influence will be somewhat limited, he will be bound for a thousand years, he will be released at the end of the thousand years, and will deceive many, and there will be a, fi a final uh, rebellion against God that will be judged very quickly uh, with fire from heaven. But And, and then, uh, at that time, uh, Matthew or uh, Revelation 20 verse 10, uh, Satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire. We assume at the same time uh, by extrapolation, uh, that is in making assumptions about the unknown from things which are known, we assume that it will be at that time that his fallen angels that now work under him are going to be, uh, they'll be cast at the same time. So that begs the question, why the delay? It's been, Jesus said, uh, way back 2,000 years ago that the, the sentence, they were already sentenced, and we assume the sentence was uh, even, was, they, they were sentenced even long before Jesus made that comment in Matthew 25, verse 41. Why the delay? And uh, you can turn with me to, to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. You're going to find that not too awful far from, uh, just turn backward from where we are in Isaiah, and you're, you're going to go through Psalm of, Song of Solomon, and uh, but you're going to find Ecclesiastes and look at verse 8, or chapter 8, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. So this is a principle of wisdom which God gave for the human race. 
And it's essentially saying something most of us understand to be true. When you, when you sentence a criminal, have the, the sentence executed quickly, whether that means the death sentence and execution for the criminal or for offenses uh, lesser than capital offenses, have them quickly uh, begin the jail term. Don't go through an endless process of appeals. Bring this thing into uh, a reasonable appeal process. And there should be a reasonable appeal process. And there usually is. And there, there isn't any good system of jur jurisprudence. A reasonable appeal process, not unreasonable. Well, in a principle God gave for man, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Well, that's definitely a valid principle for the human race. But if God would require this of man, would he not abide by the same standard himself? Or would he violate his own standard? Well, Satan and his demons have been sentenced, and now it's been thousands of years. Well, one thing to consider is that God has created time, and he himself is not confined to time. And in Second Peter 5.8, a day is as to the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as to a day. So, yes, there's been a delay, and to us it seems like a very, very long delay. To God, it's a, a, a drop in the bucket, that length of time. God is eternal. He created time. What's a, a long time or a short time is up to him. It's up to, to the one who created time, not to us. But there has been a delay. And when you put this together, this is a subject which we've studied at different times over the years, a very important area of study. And, and I've done... Uh, I think one time 26 teaching sessions on it, at other times uh, a smaller number of sessions, but we've, we've studied things fairly thoroughly. But when you consider passages like Job chapters 1 and 2 and Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll be going to these passages before we're done, not not necessarily tonight, but before we're all done with this with the consideration of the spiritual warfare, uh, which is an important part of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. When you consider these various passages and more, you may notice a heavenly parallel to what we, in our earthly systems of jurisprudence, call an appeal trial. In other words, Satan and the angels who conspired with Satan, yes, they've been sentenced, and yes, we know in the prophetic word from the omniscient God, the God of perfect eternal knowledge. We know that the sentence will be executed, but in the meantime, there is a delay in the execution of this sentence. And I believe the only reasonable explanation is that Satan has been allowed 
an appeal process because he, as the accuser, is accusing God of lacking integrity because of the sentence which has been imposed on him and his co-conspirators. And so God, in his justice, even though he doesn't really have to do it, is demonstrating his own integrity and his own love because, because the typical question posed by Satan and posed by those under Satan's influence, even though they may not realize that they're under Satan's influence, but they pose the question, how can a loving God send any of his created beings into everlasting torment in the lake of fire? And so God in a demonstration of his own love and his own justice, his own righteousness, his own complete integrity, has allowed a very public appeal process. Public because it is, uh, it, it is the subject of much narrative throughout the entire word of God. And so consider Isaiah 14. Consider Ezekiel 28, the verses that, that we studied. Consider uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, the passage we studied. Put them together with with uh, what we're studying tonight and other places we're going to go and then recognize that enter the human race and recognize the fact that in our Jeremiah 4 passage, before his fall, Lucifer, the cherub, with the privilege and duty of covering God's throne was assigned to Eden. And then what do you have with the first two human beings? Where were they? In Eden. And so enter the human race and then ultimately enter the man, Jesus Christ, who will, I think we'll see together, uh, actually who has been the chief witness for the prosecution, that is the God team in the appeal trial of Satan, Jesus Christ is the star witness because Jesus Christ came into the human race as a human being and never sinned and in fact fulfilled the, the spiritual life. He actually pioneered the very spiritual life designed for us to partake of through our baptism into union with Christ. And he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. So the Lord Jesus Christ who endured the quintessence of 
testing, the most grueling testing, the most grueling examination a human being has ever endured. We'll look at some of it in Matthew chapter 4. Again, before we're done with this study, we may not get there tonight. But in a mandate that God gave for the system of justice in his covenant nation, he included Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a person shall be put to death, not on the evidence of one witness. So while Jesus Christ is the star witness or the chief witness, other witnesses were necessary because, again, God would, in a, in a judicial proceeding of any kind, even though uh, human systems of justice are far inferior, uh, that's an understatement, but far inferior to God's system of justice. But would the Supreme Court of Heaven give a mandate for two or three witnesses to confirm testimony in human trials and not demand the same thing for an appeal process for Satan. So additional witnesses are needed. And we were created and redeemed to be those additional witnesses. Witnesses. And when I began to see these things many, many years ago, I began to really see the pieces of the puzzle come together and have the very questions of, of life answered. Why, why are we here? Why was the world created? Why was the human race created? Why are we here? What is, what is our significance? What role do we play in the plan of God? Why do people suffer? Why is there suffering? Why do innocent people suffer? Why do, why do babies suffer? And when you, you begin to see the big picture of this appeal process, then all those questions and more start to get answered. And you find understanding. And it's not that you won't still have questions, but... but Life makes a whole lot more sense, and even our existence on this planet makes a whole lot more sense. Now you can turn to Job chapter 1 with me. We only have a few more minutes, so we will not get any further tonight than Job chapter 1. And I'm going to get, I'm going to cut right to the chase. I won't even give any introductory material. Uh, but most of you are somewhat familiar with Job. There uh, are a number of uh, views as to, uh, among Bible scholars, uh, of which I am not, as to the time of this writing. But uh, Job was definitely an ins uh, a very interesting character. Let's start at Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters, he possessed 7,000 sheep, 
3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. That is a birthday party. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. All right, beginning with verse 6, Satan gets involved. Now there was a day when the sons of God, these are angels referred to uh, such in Genesis chapter 6, elsewhere in Job. That's simply a figure of speech that uh, sometimes referred to angels. Now there was a day when we know they're angels because they directly came before God and Satan with them. So There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. Now this is as far as we'll go tonight. We'll continue right here in Job next week. But I want you to consider a couple of things here. One being that the sphere of Satan's operation, even back at the time of Job, was the earth, walking to and fro on the earth. The sphere of his operation is also the atmosphere. He is, in Ephesians 2, verse 1, the Prince or Archon, the the uh, chief ruler of the power of the and the Greek word is air. That means the atmosphere around the earth. And yet, in Ephesians six verse twelve, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities and powers, etc. And it's worded in different ways and different editions, but it comes down to in the heavenly places. So Satan and his underlings apparently still have some access to heavenly places, even uh, going before the throne of God as allowed, certainly at, at limited times, but as allowed by God for God's purposes. Why would that access even be allowed? Because Satan is being allowed to present his case. And the prosecution who typically brings up the first uh, witnesses in this case was interrupted when God directed, uh, or, or rather the, the pro- it was uh, Satan who was interrupted by God. The prosecution did bring up its witness, Job, directing Satan's attention to his servant Job. Have you seen my servant Job? Uh, Let's look at verse 8 and we'll close. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? So, the prosecution introduced a witness. Now, this there were witnesses 
even before Christ as the chief witness came in the incarnation. And there have been witnesses since. And there were witnesses before Job. And there are witnesses now after the cross and the resurrection and the, the glorious ascension of Christ. But you and I have a very important role to play regarding this great angelic conflict. We have the opportunity to be witnesses for the prosecution, as was Job, as were the witnesses in Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll be studying that portion as well. Let's close with prayer, prayer tonight. Father, thank you for the insight that you continually give us into your plan and your purpose, your overall purpose and your purpose for us. We thank you for giving your Son to us so that we might be both redeemed and enriched as we come to know his grace and as we come to understand what you would have us understand about him. And it is in his name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.